In this video, we look at the views that both Mark Cuban and Warren Buffett share on diversification. They both believe that it's not the right way to invest if you do understand what you're investing in. So without further ado, please do enjoy the video. Because the markets have been going through these wild gyrations, right. um, don't seem to have a clear sense of what direction is up. Uh, how do you interpret that as somebody who's spent a lot of time playing well, the market? Well, put on my, you know, manage the portfolio trader hat, um, and not so much a trader, but manage the portfolio. It's great, you know. Um, anytime there's volatility and any type, time there's change, there's opportunity. Now, I say it's great because I've taken a whole different approach to investing than most people. You know, I think buy and holds a crock of shit. I think, you know, the idea that you always have to invest your, your cash is not far behind. And so I've always been of the attitude that, um, unless you really have a, a commitment to something, just keep your money in cash, knowing that at some point in time, there are, there's going to be a week or two like we've had. But how much time, I mean, you've got a lot going on in your life. How much time do you have to actively manage your portfolio through these 500-point market swings? Well, see, that's the down? whole thing. I don't have to spend much time until, until it hits the fan. Right. So I don't I mean, a I lot of hitting the fan. this well, week. Well, that's exactly right. And that's where the opportunity is. Like I wouldn't look at my portfolio or, you know, I get I get a, you know, a one line, um, one number statement every day from um, my bank. And, you know, that tells me if anything weird happened and I wouldn't even look at it. But then when everything starts getting crazy, I call it the World Series of investing. You know, that's when you start digging in. And it's because of the approach that I take. So, you know, back in 2006 and 2007, I was writing blogs saying, look, the stock market's for suckers. You're getting put, you know, when you sit down at the business table, you always look for the sucker. And if you don't see it, it's you. And you've got all these professional people on the other side of the trades. I mean, when I started trading stocks in the early 90s after I sold my first company, you know, you could understand different elements of the market better than the professionals. So I can understand, you know, new technology from Wellfleet and Synoptics and all these old technology companies better than the traders. Today, there's so much money in these huge hedge funds, and it, then they have such professional research and in-depth research, there really aren't any advantages for the individual traders. And so my approach has always been, unless I know something specific, Put it in cash, and so. And so, what are you investing in? What are the areas that well, you what I did, feel you know? What I did when I in 2008 and 2009, I put everything into MLPs and M rates, the um, um, mortgage-backed securities, ones that I thought were the better companies, um, and I just piled in. And I also piled into Australian bonds because I thought the economy was good next to China. It was my way of playing China. So you and make one-way bets. This isn't portfolio balancing you're talking no, about. No, yeah, all that asset management, you know, diversification, that's for idiots, right? Because you because you can't you can't diversify enough to know what you're doing. Right. I mean, I did my homework on Australia. Right. I did my homework on the Emery's. I did my homework on MLPs and their pricing had just gotten crushed. And, and so what are you doing right now? So what, I'm, what I did right now, I'd, I'd been going all the dividends and everything. I'd be I put, just put into cash. And so I don't think stocks have fallen enough to just dot, to say these partic any particular stocks are cheap. Right. Hmm. So when I looked at the MLPs in 2008 and 9, they were paying 18, 19 percent for companies that had never missed a, a payment. Right. It always put out all their cash and they look dirt cheap. Now, you know, you look at good companies. Apple hasn't fallen that much. And just to be down 10, 15 percent from their highs, they're still not as low as they were 18 months ago. And so what I did was I said, self, self, there's going to be a lot of volatility. So I bought, um, put, took a little bit of money and bought out of the money calls on the, uh, on the um, spider calls I bought on the S um, standards and pours, the SP 500. And then I did the same thing on the diamonds, which is the Dow Jones. So I bought those long when I, when the stock prices cratered. And then when we had the big, not today, but the big run up before I bought a bunch of puts knowing that even though I was paying for a lot of vol volatility, that I thought there would be a lot of swings in the market. And so I so just, you're just betting on volatility. I'm just betting on and volatility. And how long is that going to last in your view? No idea. And that's the whole thing, right? People aren't buying intrinsic value in companies anymore. The whole Warren Buffett approach works great for Warren because he can put a $3 billion into an investment and take a whole different approach than John or Sally Doe investor who can't do that. Yeah. My name is Mark Hake. I'm from uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. And I am very interested in your policies on diversification and also how you concentrate your investments. And I've studied your annual reports going back a good number of years. And 
there's been years where you had a lot of stocks in your marketable, equitable securities portfolio, and there was one year where you only had three in 1987. Um, so I have two questions. Um, given the number of stocks that you have in the portfolio now, what does that imply about your view of the market in terms of is it fairly valued, that kind of uh, idea? And second of all, uh, whenever you, it seems that whenever you take a new investment, you never take less than about 5% and never more than about 10% of the total portfolio with that new position. And I wanted to see if I'm correct about that. Yeah, well, on the second point, that, there, that really isn't correct. We, uh, we have positions which you don't even see because we only listed the ones above $600 million in the last report, and obviously those are all smaller positions. Sometimes be that's because they're smaller companies and we couldn't get that much money in. Sometimes it's because the price has moved up after we've bought them. And sometimes it's because we're, we may be selling the position down even. But uh, so we have no, there's nothing magic. We like to put a lot of money in things that, uh, that we feel strongly about. And that gets back to the diversification question. Uh, you know, we, we think diversification is, as practice generally, makes very little sense for anyone that knows what they're doing. Uh, they, diversification is a protection against ignorance. I mean, if you want to make sure that nothing bad happens to you relative to the market, you own everything. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that, that is a perfectly sound approach for somebody who, who does not feel they know how to analyze businesses. If you know how to analyze businesses and value businesses, it's crazy to own 50 stocks or 40 stocks or 30 stocks probably, uh, because there aren't that many wonderful businesses at, that are understandable to a single human being in all likelihood. And it, and to have some super wonderful business and then put money in number 30 or 35 on your list of attractiveness and, and forego putting more money into number one just strikes Charlie and me as, as, as madness. And it, it, it's conventional practice and it, it, it may, uh, you know, if all you have to achieve is, is average, uh, it it's, uh, it it's, uh, may preserve your job, but it, it's a confession in our view that you don't really understand the businesses that you own. Um, you know, I base, I mean, as on a personal portfolio basis, you know, I own one stock, you know, it, but it's a business I know, it, and, and it leaves me very comfortable. Uh, so, you know, do I, do I need to own 28 stocks in order to, you know, have proper diversification, you know, and, uh, be nonsense. And within Berkshire, I could pick out three of our businesses, and I would, I would be very happy if they were the only businesses we owned and I had all my money in Berkshire. Now, I love it, the fact that we can find more than that and that we keep adding to it. But three wonderful businesses is, 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 more, than, uh, is more than you need in this life to do very well. And uh, uh, the, average, the average person isn't going to run into that. I mean, if you look at how the fortunes were built in this country, uh, they weren't built out of a portfolio of 50 companies. They were, they were built by someone who, who uh, identified with, this, with a wonderful business. Coca-Cola is a great example. A lot of fortunes have been built on that. And there aren't 50 Coca-Colas. You know, there aren't 20. If there were, it'd be fine. We could all go out and diversify like crazy among that group and, and get results that would be equal to owning the really wonderful one. But you're not going to find it. And, uh, and the truth is you don't need it. I mean, if you, if you have a really wonderful business is very well protected against, against the vicissitudes of the economy over time and, and, and the competition. I mean, you know, we're talking about businesses that are resistant to effective competition. And three of those will be better than 100 average businesses. At, uh, uh, and, and they'll be safer, incidentally. I mean, they, there is less risk in owning three easy to identify wonderful businesses there than there is in owning 50 um, well-known big businesses and uh, uh, it's amazing what has been taught over the years in finance classes about that but uh, uh, I can assure you that that uh, I would rather pick if, if I had to bet the next 30 years on the fortunes of uh, of my family that would be dependent upon the income from a given group of businesses. I would rather pick three businesses from those we own than own a diversified group of 50. Charlie? 
You know, what he's saying is that much of what is taught in modern corporate finance courses is twaddle. Do you want to elaborate on that, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> you cannot believe this stuff. I mean, <laughs> it, it's uh, modern portfolio theory, and uh, yeah, it's it's. It has no utility. But I mean, it, it it you know it will tell you how to do average, but you know I I I, I think uh, anybody can figure out how to do average in fifth grade. I mean, it, it's just not that difficult, and uh, it's it's elaborate, and you know there's lots of little Greek letters and all kinds of things to make you feel that you're in the big leagues, but it uh, there is no value added. <laughs> I have great difficulty with it because I am something of a student of dementia, and I have. <laughs> Yeah, we hang around a lot together. And I can ordinarily <laughs> classify dementia, you know, on some uh, theory structure of models, but the modern portfolio theory, uh, it involves a type of dementia I just can't even classify. Yeah. Something very strange is going on. <laughs> yeah. if, you find, if you find three wonderful businesses in your life, you'll get very rich. And, and if you understand them, Bad things aren't going to happen to that, those three. I mean, that, that's the characteristic of it. it uh... By the way, maybe that's the reason there's so much dementia. If you believe what Warren said, you could teach the whole course in about a week. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> yeah, and the high priest wouldn't have any edge over the lay people, and that, that right. never sells well. <laughs> right.